So in last week's unit, we talked about energy metabolism and the three energy systems that are associated with energy metabolism. And now what we're gonna do is kind of apply that information and look at how we expend energy and look at the, the various um, you know, components of energy expenditure and some of those factors. Like, here we go. So again, in this particular unit, we're gonna be talking about energy systems and how that's related to the exercise performance. So we're gonna take those three systems that we talked about in unit two and kind of apply those to various stressors and, and various sports to kind of understand um, how much of a nutrient we are utilizing at any given time. Okay, so again, you know, as we kind of talked about in our last unit, energy is the capacity for us to do work um, and energy can't be created or uh, destroyed. It's dynamic, it's related to change. So um, basically what we're doing when we use energy is we're transferring energy from one form to another. Okay, so again, bioenergetics has to do with the flow and exchange of energy within a given system. So essentially, we're going to take the energy from food that we consume, convert it into various forms within the body, and then be able to use it in a variety of situations. So energy metabolism is essentially um, how our body is going to transform and utilize um, those various types of energy, such as carbohydrates, proteins, and fats, um, so that we can utilize them or store them depending on, you know, need and also how much we consume. So there are three different uh, types of work associated with, you know, how we're expending our energy. So we have um, mechanical work, um, which we'll look at in the next in this um, unit. Um, we have transport work. And again, um, we'll be talking about those, oops, sorry, in the upcoming slides and then lastly, chemical work. Okay, so the three types of biological work, transport work, um, chemical work, and mechanical work. Okay, so let's take a look at these. So first thing we'll look at is chemical work. So again, what chemical work is, is essentially the energy needed in order for us to modify um, structures from a chemical standpoint in order for us to store them or utilize them. Okay, so let's take a look at some examples of how we use chemical work on a day-to-day -day basis. So we have amino acids, we have sugar or glucose, and we have fatty acids or fat. Okay, so again, those are the three macronutrients that we have consumed. So proteins or amino acids, glucose or sugar, and then our fatty acids or those fat molecules. And these arrows are showing us um, how we can convert these products into, you know, different chemical configurations. Okay, so again, I consume amino acids, I can store them in the in the protein um, form uh, that would make up our muscle mass. Okay, so again, amino acids can be linked together in order for us to produce or um, to form our muscle mass. Okay, um, and then let's say I didn't consume enough amino acids or I didn't consume enough proteins. Well, I can break down my muscle mass in order to get just those amino acids. Okay, so again, we can store them and we can also take them out of storage. Let's go over to fats. Again, I consume fats in the form of fatty acids and I can store those within the adipose tissue or the fat tissue. Again, let's say I needed more of them and I needed to get them out of storage. I can go to the adipose tissue, pull those fats out of storage and convert them into fatty acids so that we can use them for a fuel, okay? Um, notice that sugar has the most arrows uh, coming to and coming from um, it. So again, you know, um, the, the greatest diversity, you could say, as it relates to what we can do with sugars. Okay, so if I consume a lot of sugars, let's say I had a bunch of Skittles, Pop-Tarts, etc. If I have too much of those, I can convert those into fatty acids and store them as fat. Okay. I can also store glucose in the form of glycogen, which is um, basically a bunch of um, glucose molecules linked together. We can store those within the liver. I can also store those within the muscle. So I do store some carbohydrates in the muscle. Um, and as mentioned, I can store them as fat as well. So very diverse in, as it relates to what we can do with those sugar molecules. Again, I can also take those out of storage um, and put them into the blood so that I can utilize them as well. Okay. Notice that there are some amino acids that can be converted into glucose as well. 
um, and we call those gluconeogenic. Um, so basically that means that they can produce um, new sugar molecules. Again, we don't like to do that. Our body doesn't like to, to use those amino acids for that process. Um, because those amino acids are the only molecules that can be used to build something. Um, however, we can if we need to, if we're not consuming enough sugars. Okay, um, so again, those are just some examples of what we can do from a chemical standpoint. Okay. Transport work has to do with um, allowing us to move against a concentration gradient. So one of the factors that we talked about when we talked about sugar absorption was active transport. And with active transport, again, we're gonna move against the concentration gradient and that's gonna require an energy investment in the form of ATP. So these molecules are gonna move um, from a low concentration to a high concentration, um, like I said, against their concentration gradient, and that's gonna require an ATP or an energy investment, okay? Um, active transport, other examples of active transport within the body. Um, for example, in order for us to maintain electrical conduction, conduction potential like in the nervous system and also in the heart, we have to maintain or establish these concentration gradients um, within those cells and that allows the cells to be excitable. Um, so again, that transport work that we're doing um, within these cells is really important when we think about how much energy we use at rest. So like our resting metabolism is highly related to how much active transport we need to do to maintain the structures within the body. Again, some examples of those structures include both the nervous system and the cardiovascular system or the cardiac uh, muscle, because um, again, we have to maintain some pressure or concentration gradients, which is going to require an input of ATP in order to do so. Okay. Mechanical work, again, this is probably um, what we think of most commonly when we think of energy expenditure and mechanical work is just basically the energy that we need in order to have muscle contraction occurring. Okay, um, but when we think about muscle contraction, it's not only movement. So again, you know, getting up and, and walking or um, doing any type of sports activity or brushing your teeth or whatever. All of those things are going to require us to contract our skeletal muscle, which is our which is under our voluntary control, right? So again, um, we are we are in charge of you know what we do, which hand we use when we brush our teeth, and you know if you walk fast or if you walk slow, et cetera. So again, those are all within our cognitive control. But two other factors to think about when we think about mechanical work um, are our smooth muscle and also our cardiac muscle. And smooth muscle will be found in places such as the digestive tract and also the respiratory tract. Um, and again, those muscles are working um, out of our conscious control, right? So again, smooth muscle is going to contract in order for us to um, churn the stomach and allow us to digest some of the nutrients or some of the calories that we've consumed. Again, we're not consciously thinking like, hey, I need to, you know, start contracting my stomach so that I can digest this food. It's just more um, unconscious. So we don't necessarily think about those things in order for those things to happen. Okay. And also cardiac tissue, again, think of how tolling it would be if we had to think about, you know, 60 times in a minute, okay, now I need to contract my heart and now I need to contract those muscles in order to move the blood throughout the system. Okay. That would take all of our, you know, our mind basically in order for us to be able to complete just those basic tasks. So all of those things occur out of our cognitive uh, control, but are included in this category of mechanical work. Okay? So any type of muscle contraction that we have will contribute to the calories that we need um, from a mechanical standpoint. Okay. Again, when we think about metabolism, basically what we want to do is we want to sum up all the energy needs associated with each of those processes. So again, how many calories do I need in order to complete um, chemical work? How many calories do I need in order to complete transport work? And how many calories am I going to need today to complete, you know, that uh, mechanical work that we just mentioned? Okay. So again, essentially what we're doing is very simple. We're going to take food that we eat carbs, fats, proteins, we convert it into ATP, and then we use it for, you know, these three different types of biological work throughout any given day. So one thing I think that's, that's interesting and really, I guess, really fascinating, and in, in my opinion, is 
this idea of ATP. And again, think of ATP as kind of like your, your dollar, right? And I need dollars in order to, um, you know, complete all these tasks that we talked about. So in order to do work, I need to have energy and ATP, like we said, is kind of the most basic form of energy that we have. <laughs> However, what's interesting about this is, you know, we think about our bank accounts. Well, hopefully you have enough money in your bank account that you can do all the things that you need to do. You need to, you know, buy groceries, you need to pay your house mortgage, you need to buy gas, etc. So all of those things, you have enough money in your bank account in order to do so, right? But with ATP, we don't really have very much available. We have very little available of ATP, okay? We only have enough ATP to do like about three seconds of, of maximum work, okay? The rest of the ATP that we use, because certainly we use more than three seconds worth of work, ATP, um, in any given day. So what this tells us is we're constantly um, pulling energy out and converting it into ATP, okay? So we must constantly be producing ATP in order for us to continue to do work throughout our general day. Um, again, I would say that's very different than, um, you know, thinking about money. Like I don't need to liquidize my assets. I don't need to, um, you know, get money out of my stocks and bonds or something like that in order to pay for groceries each week. Right. But with ATP, we do need to do that. Right. We have to liquidize um, some of these nutrients that we have stored in order to get this currency available and ready to go. And so we're constantly doing that. This slide I think is really cool. I like images. I like the arrows. Um, I like, you know, kind of like a, um, the visual here, but don't get caught up on everything that's going on. What I want to accomplish with this slide is just um, have us really appreciate all that's going on in order for us to metabolize food, in order for us to use that energy on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay, so again, we look at our diet, we're consuming fats, we're consuming carbs, we're consuming proteins, and then we can do all these different things with them, right? So again, those proteins can be broken down to amino acids. We can store them um, within the body as a protein. So again, that's going to be generally found in the muscle mass. We can also keep them in something known as the amino acid pool, which basically means they're readily available for us to do some different things with them. Okay, um, again, we look at carbs, we're going to break those down into glucose. If I overconsume glucose, I'm going to store it as fat. Um, if I have, you know, just the right amount, I'm going to put that glucose in what's called a gluc our glucose pool. And with that glucose pool, I can store some in the form of glycogen. Um, I'm going to use some in order to fuel my brain. Um, I'm going to use some to fuel um, my tissues, like the, the muscles and things like that throughout the day. Um, and as we mentioned, I might store excess amounts of glucose within the fat. Okay. Again, fats, we're going to break down into free fatty acids. I can put them into this free fatty acid pool. I can store some and I can also use them um, from a metabolic standpoint as a fuel. Okay. So again, don't get caught up in, in some of these terms again, like glucogenesis just um, tells us that we're producing um, glycogen molecules and things like that. So don't get caught up on these terms. Just appreciate that there's a lot of things going on here, that the system is extremely dynamic in nature, that we're constantly converting things into various forms in order to provide us with the appropriate amount of ATP. So again, this should be a review from uh, lecture number two, but we've got those three energy systems. We have the ATP-CP system, which is creatine phosphate or phosphocreatine system. Again, when we think about the duration of the system, it'll last us anywhere from one to, I would say 12 seconds. I think 20 seconds is too much um, here. But again, this is our highest intensity type of, of energy source. It's anaerobic in nature. It doesn't require oxygen. Um, we can get this ATP from um, what we have stored in the muscles. And again, I said that might last us five seconds. Um, this slide says that it lasts us one to four seconds. And then we're going to have to use that creatine phosphate in order to regenerate the ATP within that given muscle. Um, again, this pathway in general will last us approximately 10 to 12 seconds. Okay. 
that second energy system known as the lactic acid system, anaerobic glycolysis, um, you know, those terms can be kind of used interchangeably. This system will last us approximately, um, you know, up to two minutes, 90 seconds to two minutes in duration. Again, anaerobic in nature, so it doesn't require oxygen. And what, where are we getting these fuels? Well, we're going to get them from sugars. Okay, so we're going to use glycogen, which is our storage form of, of sugars, um, in order to get the system up and running. Um, we are going to produce lactic acid or lactate, which we know is, is kind of a threat for us as we think about, you know, these waste products associated with the system. Again, this system is kind of intermediate in power um, and intermediate in, in regards to its total capacity for work. Um, and so that's kind of that intermediate system. And then lastly, we have the aerobic system um, can last us really an infinite amount of time. So again, we could do work from an aerobic standpoint for many, many hours. Um, aerobic means that it's using oxygen in order to do so. And this is the only system of the body that we can use fats, we can use proteins, and we can certainly use carbs. Okay, these top two systems, we're only using carbohydrates. And it's not until we get to this aerobic system that we're able to utilize fats, we could also dip into proteins. Again, we don't want to do that, but we could if we need to. Um, and we can certainly use carbs in the system as well. So this is interesting. So this takes a look at uh, percentage of our total energy um, and what's going on as we think about time. So one thing that I think is important for us to remember is that in reality, we're using all three of these energy systems at any given time. Um, however, when we say, you know, this system is in charge for, you know, the first 10 seconds or whatever, what I'm saying is this system is the dominant system during that time. Okay, so again, here you can see, you know, I'm starting an exercise bout in that first 10 to 12 seconds. This ATP phosphocreatine system or this phosphagen system is really dominating. Almost 100% of our energy can come from this particular system. As I stretch myself out to that kind of that 20 second mark, now you can see kind of the overlay. I've got all three systems contributing. Um, I've got an equal contribution of the phosphagen system and this anaerobic glycolytic system or this um, lactic acid system. So again, you know, you've got um, both, both of those uh, systems providing energy for that particular scenario. As I kind of increase uh, the amount of time that I'm doing the exercise, let's get us to 60 seconds. And notice that I'm using primarily the glycolytic system, but you can see that the aerobic pathway or this oxidative system is also on the rise. So it's con continuing to provide us with energy as the time um, increases, okay? Now I get to 130 seconds or a little over two minutes in duration and notice that about 80-ish uh, percent of our energy is now coming from the oxidative pathway and maybe 20-ish um, or 20 to five, somewhere in that range, 20% of our energy is coming from the anaerobic glycolytic system. Okay? Um, if I were to extend this chart out, we would see that the glycolytic pathway is going to dip down even further and we'll go to almost exclusively relying on that oxidative system as we continue to increase the duration of the exercise. Okay. So again, you know, we, we talked a little bit about, you know, the types of work that we can do within the body, but let's take a look at, you know, what's going on from a caloric standpoint, right? How many calories am I burning in any given day? So my energy expenditure, how many calories I need for any given day is going to be based on three variables. So number one, resting metabolic rate, um, also known as basal metabolic rate, um, accounts for about 60 to 75% of our total energy expenditure. We have something known as the thermic effect of food, and this will account for about 10% of my total um, daily energy expenditure. Um, thermic effect of food is basically the amount of calories I need to um, invest in order to break down um, the foods that I've consumed and absorb them and get them into the appropriate state, um, depending on the needs of the body. And then thermic effect of activity, this is the energy I need to do any type of activity that's above just sitting still. 
Okay. So again, thermic effective activity um, would include any type of physical activity. So not exercise, just physical activity. So physical activity might in, include um, me playing with my kids tonight. Um, it might include me walking to and from my car. It might include me, um, I don't know, what else I might do during the day. If I go to the grocery store, right? So walking around the different aisles and things like that. So those are all examples of physical activity, but not necessarily planned exercise. Okay. Thermic effect of activity also includes exercise, right? Um, and so, you know, the, the demands of exercise are certainly, um, you know, going to be greater than that of physical activity. However, we've got to think about, you know, what are, what's a normal day like for an individual, right? So again, let's say I was a waitress, for example. Um, my thermic effect of activity might be really high, yet I might not do any actual planned exercise. I'm just simply walking around a lot as part of my occupation, as part of my job. Um, so again, we've got to think about, you know, not only what we're doing for the exercise about, but also what's a normal day like for us as it relates to general movement, general physical activity, and those types of things. Um, this I just think is interesting. I'm not going to test you on this or, or anything like that, but um, you've maybe heard of, of something known as a negative calorie food. And again, on the previous slide, we mentioned a component, which was the thermic effect of food. And again, the thermic effect of food has to do with how much of an investment I need to make in order to digest and absorb certain nutrients. And all of these foods, these negative calorie foods, are foods that have a higher investment than their actually than their actual caloric value okay so what i'm saying is if an apple gives me a net calorie gain of 40 calories for example okay it might cost me 50 calories in order to break down and absorb and, and actually utilize those calories okay so what i'm saying is i'm burning more calories by eating it than the net calorie gain of that particular item Okay. Um, same thing, check out on the veggie side a lot. We're looking at a lot of dark leafy, you know, dark green vegetables. So um, you've got, you know, asparagus, broccoli, you've got, um, you know, cucumbers, different spinach, kale would fall under this category, zucchini. Okay, so again, a lot of dark green um, vegetables certainly fall into this category. Now, one thing to keep in mind when we think about both the fruits and veggies on these lists in order for them to be negative calories, they have to be raw. Um, so we have to eat these items raw. Um, certainly you're gonna eat an apple raw, but you know, let's say like, for example, I'm not gonna eat asparagus raw. I'm going to cook it and I'm gonna cook it um, with olive oil and you know, a little salt and pepper or something like that. But the cooking of those items um, causes us to lose some of that investment, if that makes sense, right? Um, so when we cook it, those items are easier for us to digest and metabolize. So um, we lose some of the, um, the that negative calorie benefit. And the other thing to keep in mind is you have to eat it, you know, just plain. Like I'm never just going to eat a stick of celery. I'm going to have it with ranch dressing or I'm going to have it with peanut butter. Well, okay. So those items would, you know, kind of remove this negative calorie benefit. But again, I just think this is kind of something interesting to think about, you know, individuals that are interested in weight loss. Okay, well, let's try to hit a lot of these items throughout any given day um, in order for us to kind of maximize our, you know, calorie expenditure when we think about, you know, the investment needed to break down some of these foods. Okay. Um, you know, one of the other factors we said was resting metabolism or basal metabolic rate. Um, again, resting metabolism and basal metabolism can be used kind of interchangeably. Um, and again, this is kind of the minimum amount of calories that we need in order to maintain our just general health, general um, physiologic function while we're at rest. Okay, so again, this accounts for chemical work, transport work, and mechanical um, work just in order for us to stay alive. Okay. So what are some factors that affect our resting metabolism or our basal metabolic rate? Um, certainly gender is, is a major factor here. Males are generally going to have higher basal metabolic rates than our females. Genetics is going to play a huge role here. Um, again, you know, some people will be able to burn, you know, 1400 calories easily at rest without doing anything. Um, my little brother never, you know, works out, never really eats healthy or anything else like that, but he's always going to have a six pack. 
Okay. He's just got good genetics. Right. Um, so again, he's always been thin and lanky and, and doesn't really have to worry about his weight. So from a genetic standpoint, he has a very high basal metabolic rate. Okay. Um, body size is another factor that's important uh, in determining someone's uh, basal metabolic rate. Okay. Uh, the larger someone is, the more calories they need in order to maintain their just normal physiologic function. Um, also body type. So again, we think about, you know, someone that's 150 pounds and 30% body fat versus someone who's 150 pounds and 6% body fat, right? The leaner person, the person that's more fit, if they have more muscle mass, they're going to require more energy at rest in comparison to somebody who has more fat mass. So muscle mass is a huge factor. Um, when we think about basal metabolic rate and Muscle mass is actually more important when we think about gender than gender itself from a biological standpoint. And the reason for that is, is again, that muscle mass requires more energy in order for us to maintain it. And the reason that, you know, we kind of throw gender into that equation is men generally, again, um, from, you know, a statistical standpoint, have more muscle mass than the average female. So males on average have more muscle mass than the, the average female. And so again, that's a huge contributor when we think about um, energy needed at rest. Food consumption, what I'm eating will play a role in our basal metabolic rate. So again, if I'm eating a lot, um, I will actually increase my basal metabolic rate. And I can have about a 10% swing either direction as it relates to how much energy I need. Um, so again, basal metabolic rate could increase 10% if I eat a lot, it could decrease 10% if I'm really restricting what I'm consuming. And then activity level will also play a role. Um, activity level certainly uh, will, you know, allow us to expend a lot of energy during the activity. So that's the, um, you know, the thermic effect of activity, but it also has more of a lasting effect on our resting metabolism after the exercise bout is over. And we'll talk about that uh, later in this unit. <clears throat> Let's see, um, other issues or other factors. So um, environmental conditions. So um, if it's extremely hot or if it's extremely cold, both of that, those tend to increase our, our basal metabolic rate um, because we've got this act to try to regulate body temperature. So if I have to work to um, maintain my body temperature, that's gonna cost something. So again, if it's a really hot environment, I'm going to need to activate, you know, my sweat glands and, and modify where I'm sending my blood in order to, you know, get rid of, of heat. So that will cause a, a, a small increase in basal metabolic rate. But actually, if I was interested in losing weight, it'd be better to put myself in a cold environment. I burn more calories in a cold environment than in a hot environment. In a hot environment, I'm just getting rid of fluids, um, but not necessarily calories in a cold environment, I'm going to actually burn those calories um, by shivering. Okay. So shivering will cause us to um, burn a significant amount of calories and therefore increase that uh, basal metabolic rate. Um, other issues that might affect, you know, basal metabolic rate, caffeine, drug usage, tobacco, for example, um, pregnancy would certainly increase this as well. So lots of factors here to think about. Okay. So again, we said that exercise was a factor that would um, allow us to increase our resting um, metabolic rate, okay? And aerobic exercise, but again, I would, I would open this up and say not just aerobic exercise. Let's take a look at resistance training and anything where we're doing uh, you know, exercise with a fair amount of intensity will cause us to increase that resting metabolic rate, okay? Two reasons for this. Number one, we've got some hormonal changes when we do aerobic exercise. Okay, so we are going to increase the release of epinephrine, norepinephrine, growth hormone, glucagon, and cortisol. Okay, so let me say those again. You want to write these down. So the hormones that are going to be affected by exercise include epinephrine, norepinephrine, growth hormone, glucagon, and cortisol. Okay, and... Um, <clears throat> This is really interesting. So the epinephrine and norepinephrine are kind of like those feel good um, 
neurotransmitters that we release. So if you've ever done a workout and like you weren't super excited to do it and um, but then you get out there and you do the workout and you get done, you're like, wow, I, you know what? I'm glad I did that. I feel really good after doing that. Um, the reason you feel really good after that is because you had the release of those hormones. You release that epinephrine and norepinephrine and those are kind of like feel good hormones. Um, <clears throat> The other reason that we are seeing an effect of our resting metabolic rate as it relates to doing regular exercise is we have an elevated metabolic rate immediately following exercise. Okay. And this is pretty freaking cool. This is called EPOC or excess post-exercise oxygen consumption. Okay. So let's look at what's going on from a metabolic standpoint when we do exercise. Okay. So here, on this axis, you can see minutes of exercise, and here you can see oxygen consumption on the y-axis. Okay? So this is showing us up to seven minutes, and the exercise bout itself is occurring from about 45 seconds to like 5.30 or something like that. Okay? When I begin exercising, I have an immediate need for oxygen, which is going to create something known as an oxygen deficit. So I immediately need oxygen because I started, let's imagine that I'm jogging. Okay? So I start my jog and I immediately need oxygen. However, this red line shows us actual oxygen consumption. So we know that it takes our body like a little while in order for us to like realize what's going on. Okay? So in this particular example, at around two minutes and 30 seconds, I now have reached steady state. So my oxygen demand and my oxygen consumption are matching, okay? So this jog is a nice, easy, steady, no problem, I can maintain this pace, okay? However, I created this deficit at the beginning of the exercise where I needed the oxygen, however, my body hadn't kind of like caught up with, with that need yet, okay? Um, this is why when you start exercise, like if you've ever gone for a jog in the first couple of minutes, you're like, this freaking sucks. This is so hard. I don't want to do this. And then eventually, if you keep going, you reach a point where you're like, okay, like this is fine. I can do this. Like I, this is fine. I feel better, right? This process is why we warm up, right? So again, it's going to allow us to get through this deficit phase and get to the steady state phase. Okay. Um, and so then, you know, I stopped my exercise bout and now imagine that I was running a pretty fast pace or whatever. Okay. I immediately stop my exercise bout, but I'm still breathing hard. Right. So I stop running, but I'm still breathing hard for like quite a while. Right. My need for oxygen has immediately dipped down when we think about what's going on from a metabolic standpoint. However, I'm still breathing hard. And the reason for that is this oxygen debt. And this is an extra volume of oxygen that I'm consuming after the exercise bout is over. Okay, That's this excess post-exercise oxygen consumption or this EPOC is this oxygen debt. So I'm paying back what I owed over here. Okay, I'm also kind of restoring many of my energy systems in the body um, in order to get myself back to a true resting state. Okay. So what is this oxygen debt used for? Um, it's going to produce, you know, ATP or replenish the ATP that I used during that exercise. It's also going to replenish some of the muscle glycogen that I might have used during the exercise. Um, so if I produced lactic acid, it can take that lactate and it can convert it back into sugar in order to store that. Um, so we can resynthesize muscle glycogen from the lactate. Okay. Um, again, I'm going to restore my oxygen levels within the blood. Um, and I'm going to begin to work to repair any muscle damage that occurred during the exercise bout. So for example, if I lifted or I did like a hard hill workout, for example, I'm going to elicit quite a bit of muscle damage and that's okay. Muscle damage is okay. That's not a bad thing. Um, because that's going to allow us to build that muscle stronger than what it was previously. So every time we work out, we're eliciting at least some amount of muscle damage. And so, you know, this extra oxygen is going to help us to um, repair that muscle stronger than what it was before. 
The last thing I'm going to use this oxygen debt for is to restore body temperature um, after that exercise. So again, I was running pretty hard. I got kind of sweaty. So now I need to get my body temperature back to its normal resting amount. Okay. So net takeaway from this is this epoch that's occurring post-exercise. Anytime I'm consuming oxygen, that can equate to burning calories, basically. Okay. So the more oxygen I consume, the more calories I burned. And so this, think of this nice little thing as kind of like bonus calories. Okay. So if I ran, let's say I ran two miles and I burnt 200 calories during that particular exercise bout, after exercise, I get these bonus calories. Maybe I get 50 bonus calories from this oxygen debt that's above and beyond the energy that I burned during that actual exercise bout. So this stuff is freaking awesome because now I get kind of like these bonus calories um, after the exercise bout is over that allow me to kind of get back to that resting position that we talked about. So that's freaking cool. So check this out. So, you know, how much does this epoch account for or how long am I going to utilize these kind of bonus calories after the exercise is over? Well, it turns out that if I increase the intensity or duration of my exercise, I will also increase my bonus calories, okay? So high in intensity, high duration will allow me to increase epoch, okay? So linear relationship here, okay? Um, so again, I want you to think about this in a variety of settings. If I go for a run, you know, like we just mentioned, if I run two miles, I might get a little bit of epoch, but not a lot. If I run seven miles, right, maybe at the same pace, so the intensity stayed the same, but I increased the duration, I'm certainly going to increase the amount of calories post-exercise needed to repair and recover myself. Okay, so that's an example of duration. Um, let's say I do the same 20 minute exercise bout, but you know, I've increased the intensity. So instead of doing 20 minutes easy, I'm doing 20 minutes all out, then I will certainly see an increase in epoch as well. Okay, so let's think about how this might apply to um, sports and how this might apply to like your real life, right? So imagine that I'm at a um, tournament. Okay, so I'm at a um, let's go wrestling. Okay. So I'm at a wrestling tournament and I've got to wrestle maybe four times in one day. So instead of just having one match, I've got, you know, four matches throughout this day kind of spread out. Right. Um, so again, uh, maybe wrestling wasn't a great example. Let's go. Um, let's go soccer. Maybe I'm in a soccer tournament and, you know, I've played multiple games, um, you know, within a two to three day span. Okay. Once I'm done with that, um, my mom always thinks that this was like, she could never get her wrap her mind around this. You know, I, I grew up playing basketball and, and running and, and those, um, playing, uh, basketball and, and track and cross country. But like we'd have a basketball tournament and, you know, like Friday, Saturday or something. And on Sunday, I could like just freaking eat a full pizza myself. And I would just be like laying around, you know, like relaxing, but I would be like just starving, right? Well, that's what epoch is, right? So a lot of times this epoch can last us actually up to 48 hours after um, the exercise bout is over. So um, I'll just tell you one quick story um, and then we can kind of move on. But so I, you know, I've done um, all sorts of different ultra triathlons, marathons, all these different types of races, um, bike races, uh, and, and all these things. So I have this goal. I want to do a race in all 50 States. And so, um, I'm, I'm up to like 40, I think I've done 40 or 41 States right now. So I'm getting close, but, um, a few years ago, my husband and I, we drove over to Ohio and I was doing this marathon there. And, uh, so, you know, it's a Saturday, no, it was a Sunday morning race. And so I get up, I do the marathon and like I did well, it was a good time for me and everything. And so, um, you know, pretty high intensity or whatever. And so I finished the race. I'm like, not really hungry. I have like a Pepsi and, you know, like, I don't know, like a granola bar or something. Cause my stomach's kind of like not great. Um, and so then we start heading back to Iowa. And so it's, you know, it's, I don't know, it's maybe like an eight hour drive or something like that to get back to Dubuque. And so, you know, we start driving and we get like an hour in and um, we stopped and I got like a full meal. Like I got like a, you know, like a hamburger and French fries or whatever. Like I know I chose really good 
nutritional things. Okay. Go another two hours and I have to get another full meal. So I ended up getting like three full meals in that same afternoon after, you know, running this marathon, but again, that's all epoch. Um, so again, this can last us, you know, a long time, uh, post-exercise, depending on that intensity and duration of the, of the workout or event. Okay. So, you know, so let's think about metabolic rate during exercise now. So we've talked about what happens after exercise and how, um, exercise can elevate my resting metabolism, but what about what's going on during the exercise bout? Well, energy expenditure is, is directly proportionate to intensity. Okay. So again, you know, if I'm, if I'm working at a low intensity, I'm going to burn a smaller amount of calories. If I work at a high intensity, I'm going to see a linear increase in the amount of calories that I need per hour. This is relative to the individual. So what do I mean by that? Okay. So, um, imagine me as a 34 year old, um, mediocre runner, right? And so, you know, I can go out and run um, an eight minute mile. Okay. And for me, that's a moderate intensity. Okay. So if I were to run eight minute miles for an hour, let's say I burn 700 calories, because that's a pretty good pace for me. Okay. Now imagine that I'm working with one of the, you know, the, the college uh, athletes here at Loris, um, Cassie, for example, who is a very good runner. Okay. So if she were to run that same intensity as me, she would burn less calories because that's an easier pace for her. So while I might burn 700 calories, maybe she's only going to burn 600 calories or something like that. Right. So relative to the individual, we both traveled at the same speed. However, her being more fit than me would allow um, her to burn less calories. So the intensity was lower for her from a relative standpoint. Okay. Um, one other factor to think about when we think about submaximal exercise, if I work at a low intensity, I'm able to utilize fat as a fuel. If I work at a high intensity, I absolutely have to use carbohydrates as my fuel source. Okay. So um, in order for me to kind of um, use fats as a fuel, I have to go long though. I have to go at least 30 minutes in order for me to even mobilize and get those fats available for use. Um, whereas, you know, the carbohydrates are going to be great for high intensity, but also short duration exercise as well. So this kind of shows you that overlap between the use of fats and the use of carbohydrates as a fuel. Again, during high intensity exercise, check this out. Basically, 100% of our fuel is coming from carbohydrates. Okay, So if there's really one thing that you can take out of this class, if I'm coaching in a sport where we're requiring an athlete to do high intensity, they absolutely have to fuel themselves appropriately with good carbs. Okay. If they want to optimize their performance, that's the one thing that they can do, right? A low carb diet is no good. If I'm interested in doing anything at the highest potential that I can from a intensity standpoint. Okay. If I'm interested in doing something at a low intensity, I can use about 85% fats. I'm still going to use some carbs because as we know, carbohydrates um, are kind of the primer in order for us to utilize fats. So fats burn in a carbohydrate flame. I always have to have some fats or I'm sorry, some carbs in order for me to burn fats. Okay. Intensity of about 60% here, you can see this crossover. So I'm getting about 50 and 50 um, as it relates to, you know, carbs percentage and fats percentage. Okay. So again, when we think about maximal exercise, as I already mentioned, really one key takeaway I want you to get from this class is we absolutely need carbs if we're interested in working at our highest potential. Okay, So we're completely reliant on carbohydrates as an energy source during maximal exercise. Don't make your body work harder than it has to. Right, Give yourself the appropriate carbohydrates leading up to exercise in order to fuel yourself so that you can work at this highest potential. Energy is extracted from that ATP phosphocreatine system. We're also going to use anaerobic glycolysis. Those aerobic pathways um, will play a minimal role when we're doing maximal exercise. Okay, So again, um, oxygen not important for us during maximal exercise because we're going to utilize that creatine phosphate and anaerobic glycolytic pathway. 
So what limits us during maximal exercise? So again, when we think about um, from a nutritional standpoint or from a metabolic standpoint, what are, what are kind of our limiters for us? Okay. So during maximal exercise, what, you know, um, stops one person before it, it stops an elite athlete, for example. Okay. So one factor will be energy depletion. Okay. So I can run out of that ATP phosphocreatine storage um, within, you know, like we said, about 12 seconds. So that energy will de be depleted between 10 to 12 seconds. The more fit I am, the closer I get to that 12 second mark um, when it comes to energy depletion. Okay. Um, from that anaerobic glycolytic system, we're not ever really going to run out of carbs um, as long as we're fueling appropriately. We're not going to run out of carbs with that in that anaerobic glycolytic pathway. The limiting factor for us in that pathway is the buildup of waste products. So as I, you know, do that anaerobic glycolytic pathway and I start to produce more lactate and I start to produce more hydrogen molecules that acidity within the muscles, that is a limiter for us, okay? So again, if I'm using kind of that intermediate system, it's more likely gonna be the buildup of waste products that stop us as opposed to within that ATP phosphocreatine system, um, our limiter might be, you know, um, having that fuel available. So the availability of the, the fuel source, okay? Um, let's see other, you know, issues when we think about maximal performance. And again, um, we'll talk about these in some of the other classes. Um, number one is going to be a failure of the nerves to um, transmit an impulse. So again, we'll talk about that in the sports physiology class. And then, you know, man, we think about pain tolerance and some of those factors. I love talking about that stuff. So psychological limits to performance as well, you know, is an elite athlete, different from a physiological and a metabolic standpoint? Yes, absolutely. But from a psychological standpoint, they also have the upper hand, right? If I believe I can push myself further, you know, that makes a huge difference as it relates to my maximal exercise capacity. Um, that is just as important as it, as, you know, some of these metabolic factors that we are going to talk about in this class. Okay. So here, this kind of shows you um, really looking at kind of a longer duration exercise bout. So this is up to 300 minutes of exercise. And here you can see our substrate use. So which fuel am I using um, based on the number of minutes completed? Okay. So again, I'm going to use muscle glycogen um, right off the bat for the first probably 30 minutes. I have enough muscle glycogen to last me if I wanted to, to last two to three hours, probably in duration, probably more like two hours if I'm, you know, working really hard. Um, notice that fats are going to begin to be mobilized around 30 minutes. And here you can kind of see this crossover. This is probably around 45 to 50 minutes um, where I'm using both carbs and fats kind of in an equal quantity. And as I continue that exercise bout, if I'm going to work out, you know, two, three hours, something like that, the use of fats is going to continue to rise um, as the duration of the exercise increases. Okay, so when we think about glucose metabolism or sugar usage, um, again, we said sugars or carbs are going to be our primary fuel source during high intensity exercise. So how can we increase um, how much sugar we have within a given muscle, right? How can I kind of enhance my maximal capacity to utilize carbohydrates? So carbohydrates can be stored, as we've mentioned, in the form of glycogen, and we must be able to retrieve that glycogen or kind of um, access the storage form and break down that glycogen through a process known as glycogenolysis. And this process of glycogenolysis is going to allow us to take that storage form of glycogen and break it down into those simple sugar molecules or into these glucose molecules. Once we have the nutrients in the form of glucose, we're going to dump it into the blood and then um, it's going to carry, you know, to wherever we, we're doing work. So, for example, if I'm riding my bike, okay, I want to drop off those glucose molecules in my leg muscles. Okay. Um, so, again, not so concentrated in my upper body because it's not really doing anything when I ride a bike. Um, so, I'm going to deliver those directly to the muscles where they need them, which is going to be in my legs. 
four hormones are important um, in order for us to increase the amount of glucose that we have within the bloodstream. Okay. Um, we've got epinephrine, norepinephrine, cortisol, and glucagon. So those are your four hormones that are important um, in order for us to increase glucose um, within the bloodstream. And the cool thing, the good news, if you remember back a few slides ago, was we said those hormones actually increase when we do exercise. So like, that's pretty freaking cool. All this stuff is just taken care of within the body. We didn't even know what was going on. And we're going to increase those hormones. That's going to allow us to increase the amount of glucose that we have available to be utilized during that given exercise bout. So that's freaking cool. Check this out. Turns out the longer I exercise, and I could even take this out and put intensity on this axis, the greater the increase in these hormones. Okay, so I'm going to release a little bit of these hormones if I do 10 minutes. I'm going to release a little bit more if I do more like 30 minutes and so on and so forth. Okay, so here are the spelling of, of those um, hormones. Um, I know I just, you know, said them out loud. So now you've got kind of the appropriate spellings for these hormones. So epinephrine, norepinephrine, uh, growth hormone, cortisol, and glucagon are all going to increase sort of linearly um, based on the intensity of the exercise. Insulin is going to decrease. Okay, so let's take a look at what each of these kind of hormones do uh, and why they're benefiting us from a metabolic standpoint and from an exercise capacity standpoint as well. Okay, so epinephrine, norepinephrine, again, those are kind of like those feel good hormones. Um, so again, we're going to release those. Those have a ton of good benefits for us um, when we think about exercise capacity. Um, I'll hit on just a few. I'm trying to not get into too much physiology because try to save that for um, your sport physiology class. But what's cool about these? Um, these are, A, they make you feel good. So again, when you exercise and you get done, you're like, oh, I feel so great after doing that workout. That's because you had a nice release of these two hormones. The other cool things that they do, they can block pain receptors. Um, so again, it kind of um, blunts the, the pain of working hard. Um, we also release these, like, let's say you, I know I already use biking, but let's say you got in a bike crash um, and you had all that adrenaline rush, or maybe you had some sort of injury, you tore your ACL or something like that, right? You get this big adrenaline rush from that kind of impact happening. And um, that adrenaline, which is epinephrine and norepinephrine, blocks pain receptors so that you don't experience the pain until these kind of wear off. Um, a few years ago, I got in this like really awesome, it was like really intense bike crash. Um, I was going too fast. I was on this like hairpin turn and it was kind of wet and I was, I'm kind of like, I'm a little bit like reckless. Like I don't have any fear at all. Um, which is, which is great when you mountain bike. Um, but I also then like crash sometimes, but anyway, so a few years ago I was, I was riding too fast on this, um, windy road and got, got to this hairpin turn and it was wet because it had just rained and my bike came out from underneath me and I went flying off my bike and I was going pretty fast. And, uh, um, my entire leg I had on shorts, my entire leg was just like totally raw and skinned up. And this guy in this truck, like stopped, like, Oh my God, um, do you want me to drive you home? I'm like, no, I'm fine. I, my bike's fine. I'm going to ride home. He's like, okay, well, I'm just going to follow you home because you do not look okay. And I'm like, whatever, dude, it's fine. And so I like ride home and, um, this guy follows me and I make it back and everything. And, um, then I like get in the shower. And by that time, like the adrenaline, this has worn off. And then I was like, just bawling because it was just throbbing and it hurts so bad. It was just really incredible. But anyway, epinephrine, norepinephrine is cool because it can block some of those pain receptors. Anyway, let's talk about some of these other ones. So cortisol is a stress hormone and cortisol is going to be released anytime we do anything stressful. So exercise is a stressor to the body. So we're going to release cortisol and that's going to help us in the recovery process following exercise, but it also helps us to get some sugars into the blood. Okay. Growth hormone is another one that's going to help us with the repair process post-exercise. Um, again, it will stimulate the release of sugars into the bloodstream, but really its job is to help us recover after the exercise bout is over. Glucagon is a hormone that is very specifically um, related to sugars. So glucagon is going to allow us to mobilize the glycogen stores and dump single sugars into the blood. 
Okay, so that's going to increase, and that's really the key to increasing sugar levels in the blood during exercise. Okay, insulin must decrease. And insulin's job is to help us to store sugars. So generally we release insulin after we eat a meal. So let's say I have my peanut butter and jelly sandwich that I'm gonna have for lunch. If I eat that here, um, I'm gonna release insulin and that's gonna help me to take those carbs that I consumed that are in the jelly and in the bread and put those into storage. So that's gonna allow us to store things. So glucagon and insulin work in opposition. Okay, so I never want to be releasing them both at the same time because that's inefficient. Okay, so glucagon is going to help me to use sugars. Insulin is going to help me to store sugars. So I want to only be doing one or the other at any given time. And so during exercise, I increase glucagon, which is going to help me to get sugars out of storage. Okay, so now let me tell you more of the story. And I think I'm going to draw you a little picture so that we can understand in a little more detail how insulin works. Okay, this is my bloodstream. And this is like a little cell. Okay, so I eat like my um, peanut butter sandwich. And now I've got all these little sugar molecules floating around in my blood. Okay. And so in order to get those into storage, I have these little like gates. Imagine this is like a little door and insulin. Let's see if I can draw an eye here is the key to unlock this door. Okay. So I eat my sandwich, I've got the sugar in the blood, insulin is released, and that's going to allow me to unlock the door. And as I unlock the door, the sugars can come into this cell so that I can store them. Okay. These sugars cannot come into the cell without having some sort of door opened. Okay. So this door that relies on insulin is known as a GLUT1 transporter, okay? So imagine this is like your front door of the house, okay? So um, I'm gonna use my key in order to unlock that door and boom, sugars come in. So that's what happens when I eat food, okay? During exercise, however, we said insulin decreases, but I'm putting all these sugars into my bloodstream. So I've gotta figure out a way to get those sugars into the blood without having the key to unlock the front door, okay? So I have this other door, the back door is known as GLUT4. And during exercise, I can use GLUT4, which imagine that is the back door, without a key, it's unlocked. So in comes sugar without the use of insulin, okay? So um, GLUT4 is great during exercise because that's gonna allow us to get those sugars in without having the key the front door, which is insulin here, okay? So with training, if I regularly train, if I regularly use sugars during exercise, which would be basically every single athlete that does anything with maximal intensity, I can increase the amount of little doors that I have. If I have more GLUT4 transporters or more back doors, basically, that's going to allow me to um, get more sugars in faster. Okay. The more sugars I can get in, the faster I can get those sugars in, the greater my exercise capacity, which is great news. That's why we train so that we can manipulate some of these factors to increase our capacity to do work. Okay, So that is good news for us as it relates to um, energy metabolism and the use of glucose. This GLUT4 transporter is insulin independent, and that will allow us to get sugar into the cell during exercise. Well, what about fats? So again, we talked about fats being um, a contributor for fuel or energy metabolism. Again, um, very slow to be activated. It takes 30 to 45 minutes for us to really start mobilizing fats and using fats. Okay. So in order for me to use fats as a fuel, I need to do exercise that's at least 30 to 45 minutes, moderate to low intensity, to even use those fats, to even mobilize them, okay? 
so who cares about lipids? Well, really only prolonged athletes. So endurance athletes, um, they'll be an important fuel source, not during their races, most likely, but during some of their training. Okay. So during some of their training, um, you know, prolonged lower intensity exercise, I'm going to use fats as a fuel. Okay. Very slow to be activated, um, but it's very critical for endurance exercise. So again, you know, if I'm doing something, let's say an hour or greater in duration, that will allow me to kind of really start to use some of the fats as a fuel source. So how does this work? It's the process of lipolysis. So lipolysis allows us to break down fats that are stored in the fat cells. And we're going to break those down um, into ATP eventually. Okay. Um, so again, what's cool about fat metabolism during exercise is once I once I've kind of activated fat metabolism, I'm mobilizing fat from everywhere in the body. Okay. So again, let me use my example of, of biking. Let's say I'm going to go for a two hour bike ride, right? Um, I'm not just going to use fat that's stored in my leg muscles, even though my leg muscles are the, the ones really doing the work. I'm able to mobilize fat from literally everywhere in my body, and I'm going to dump that fat into the bloodstream, and then it will be carried to the muscles in my legs so that I can use it during that exercise bout. Okay, so that's freaking cool. I'm able to mobilize fat from really everywhere in the body, not just the location of where I, you know, am using the muscles. Okay, um, so... So fat metabolism is, is allowing us to kind of activate, um, activate fat that's everywhere in the body. Okay. As we mentioned uh, in, in last week's unit, you know, fats burn in a carbohydrate flame. So in order for me to use fats, I have to have that carbohydrate primer. We talked about a recipe. We talked about chocolate chips and how, um, you know, the, the carbohydrates are your chocolate chips for that chocolate chip cookie recipe. I have to have the chocolate chips in order to let the recipe work. Okay, um, so I can use fats in this process, but I have to have carbs in order to prime the pump um, to allow this to work. On the contrary, I don't need fats in order to use carbs. Okay, so carbs are um, can work independently. They can do their own thing and be broken down, but fats are reliant on carbs. So fats need carbs carbs don't need fats, if that makes sense, right? So it's a really a one-way path there. Um, carbs being kind of the VIP and fats can come in and help out um, in certain situations, okay? Um, so this is that Krebs cycle that we talked about, that recipe that we talked about. Again, um, imagine that, you know, one of these intermediates has to come from carbohydrates. Um, the rest can come from a variety of sources. It could be fats. It could also be proteins. So proteins can contribute. Um, for example, alpha ketoglutarate can come from some of those amino acids. Um, Succinyl-CoA can also come from um, an amino acid. So again, you know, we can contribute both fats and amino acids into the system, but we have to have carbs in order to do so. Um, as we just mentioned, you know, energy release from protein, um, we prefer to not use protein as a fuel source, but during prolonged exercise, it's kind of um, only a matter of time before we are, you know, mobilizing and using some proteins. Probably about 10 to 15% of our energy during prolonged endurance exercise is coming from a protein source. And the way in which we're going to use that protein is a process known as deamination. And so basically what we're going to do is we're going to remove the nitrogen from an amino acid, and then we're going to dump that amino acid into the Krebs cycle. So as I mentioned, um, here's the Krebs cycle, which was that chocolate chip cookie recipe that we talked about. Alpha ketoglutarate is a great location for us to kind of enter in um, if we have an amino acid that's been deaminated. Um, some of our amino acids are known as glucogenic, which means that they can be converted into a sugar molecule um, through a process known as uh, gluconeogenesis. Um, however, we don't want to do this. The reason for this is because um, we have to remove uh, a nitrogen from this amino acid, and that can become an issue for us um, That can become an issue for us because it can lead to ketosis, which can um, negatively impact our homeostasis within the body. 
Okay. So again, you know, we can use amino acids. We have to remove or deaminate the, the amino acid. We have to remove an N molecule from the amino acid um, through a process known as ketosis that can affect our acidity levels within the body and our body doesn't like to do that. Also, this is not very efficient um, as it relates to our energy usage. Um, we're much more efficient at using carbs as an energy source as opposed to, as opposed to proteins. So can we figure out, you know, which energy source we're using and how much energy we're using at any given time? Yeah, we can. So um, for aerobic energy or aerobic metabolism, we can do something called um, a VO2 test um, or a VO2 max test. So this will allow us to determine how much oxygen we're consuming. And therefore, based on that information, we can determine how many calories we're burning. Okay. Um, so it can tell us what we're doing from an aerobic standpoint. However, it doesn't tell us anything about anaerobic fuel. So it doesn't um, can consider um, how much energy we might be using from the ATP phosphocreatine system or the anaerobic glycolytic pathway. Also doesn't tell us what fuel source we are using. We can do something else to determine that. And that's known as RER, a respiratory exchange ratio. And the respiratory exchange ratio can be um, measured at the same time as the VO2. And basically what we're gonna look at here is the amount of oxygen that we're using in comparison to the amount of CO2 that we're producing. Okay, And this will allow us to tell us what percentage of our calories are coming from fats and what percentage of our calories are coming from carbohydrates as it relates to energy expenditure. Um, it does make one assumption that there is 15% contribution from proteins um, into this equation as well. Okay, So again, the RER can give us information about what our fuel source is, um, and the VO2 can give us information about how many calories we are burning during a given exercise bout. And those are both lab tests that um, can be done by like an exercise physiologist. Okay. Um, that's it for today. Have a great day. Thanks for tuning in and I'll see you next time.